I am thoroughly delighted today to be hosting this event with the incredible Olivia Giuliana. Olivia is someone who came on my radar on the day she came on, I think everybody's radar, because she did something that was so courageous and so clever. And, you know, to bait a member of Congress and then to raise money off of that way she did was something that gave me enormous hope for America. So Olivia, it is a great honor to meet you. It's a delight to be here. And I wonder if you could just start off today by giving us a little of your backstory mm -hmm. and telling us, you know, where do you come from? And what was it that got you to find politics as a concept? Yeah, you know, I was born in Houston, Texas. I was raised in rural Texas. I moved a lot. I moved around a lot as a kid, uh, but spent most of my childhood in the hometown that not only my dad grew up in, but my grandfather grew up in. You know, when I graduated from high school, I was a third generation graduate from that high school. So very much small town America. Um, and I have always been really invested in politics. Uh, I would say more than the average young person, honestly, probably more than the average American. Um, my dad was a political science student in college, but he had to drop out because my mom got pregnant and you know he was in college on a football scholarship and he got hurt. And so he never got to finish his degree, but politics was always a staple in my household, um, which was very conservative. You know, so I grew up every single day, Fox and Friends was on the TV every single day. Uh, you know, I sat with my dad and watched the news in the evening. Uh, and I remember, you know, even as far back as being in kindergarten, uh, I was in kindergarten in 2008 when the election between Barack Obama and John McCain was happening. And I remember watching the debates and watching the election with my dad in kindergarten. And then, you know, the same in 2012 um watching you know every single debate as much news coverage as possible it was very important to my dad that i knew what was going on in politics even at a very young age and so i i kind of had more you know traditionally conservative beliefs when i was younger because you know our family really influences what we believe in and it wasn't until i got to high school I joined the debate team and uh, I had to learn how to research and I had to learn policy and I really started to kind of understand, you know, a lot of these talking points and things that I heard as a kid uh, were, were just not true. You know, I didn't agree with them. And so going into my sophomore year, I had spent, you know, the entire first part of my high school education researching federal politics and policy. And, you know, at that time, that was also right after Trump had been sworn into office as president. So kind of coming into these very formative years of adulthood in Texas um, with this really new, really weird and offsetting political environment that the country was now dealing with. And so I kind of just found myself, you know, normally just kind of being disgusted with some of the stuff that was being said. And it wasn't until my junior year of high school where I really took a very big turn into wanting to be more involved with politics. Um, it was spring break of my junior year when the country went into COVID lockdown. So my junior year of high school was cut short. And, you know, the following summer, we saw a, a global health crisis. Uh, we saw a resurgence of the civil rights movement, unlike we'd seen in a very, very long time. And we saw a, an extremely president, a contentious presidential election being set up. And so all of these things kind of led to this culmination point of, you know, I was just young and I was living in this small town conservative community and I didn't have people that I agreed with around me. And so I felt very isolated, you know, being somebody who was progressive, um, in this little farm town, you know, I didn't have people around me to represent the ideals that I had. And so I wanted to go out to Houston in March. Um, and my dad told me that 
you know, if you go out in March, don't come home because of how contentious things were. And so I kind of went, okay, you know what, fine. Like I, I won't go out in March. Um, I'll just start making videos online as young people do. And so summer of 2020, I started making TikTok videos about why and how young people should be involved in politics. And it just became a pastime for me. You know, I, I really enjoyed it. It was something I was passionate about. And uh, I got involved with what at the time was TikTok for Biden, now Gen Z for change. And, uh, you know, graduating from, from high school, I still wasn't really sure what I wanted to do. Uh, I was actually set to go to college to be a high school English teacher. I had no, in, no inclination that I was going to go into politics. It was, I wanted to be a teacher. I wanted to move back to my hometown. That was the path I was going to go on. And then Texas passed the civil bounty abortion ban law, Senate Bill 8. And so I kind of found myself in this place where I was like, you know, I really haven't gotten involved in policy in this way before on a state or a local level. Uh, and I found myself realizing, you know, this is the time for me to activate, uh, to advocate for the state that I'm from and that I love so much. And so I just started pushing and making content about Texas. And uh, I, I never really intended to get involved with, you know, abortion and reproductive health care advocacy work, um, but it just kind of happened. And, you know, there was this organization called Right to Life that put out a tip line uh, where they wanted people to report people who were aiding in abortion access. And so I, you know, I used my platform and I called on people to send in, you know, fake tips and they did in mass and it just kind of spread from there and the website, you know, it ended up being taken down and Right to Life hasn't put up another tip line like that to this day. And so from there on, you know, I was just brought into the reproductive rights community, which was very important to me, and uh, brought into Texas politics too. And, you know, from there, it's just kind of pushed me into this different space that I wasn't ready for, I wasn't prepared for, but I feel like it is the, the best thing that ever could have happened for me because I, Feel like I almost feel like I was raised for this in terms of, you know, my dad, I always say, um, he did not shape my political opinions, but he shaped my political mind in the way of, it was very important to my father that I know how to debate, I know how to back up what I believe in, and I stand my ground on my morals and my ethics, even if they're unpopular. Um, and so, you know, I think being raised in Texas uh, is a big part of what has made me who I am. Uh, you know, Barbara Jordan, she's a congresswoman from Texas, she once said, it, I believe it is in the soil and spirit of Texas that gives me the feeling that I as an individual can accomplish anything and that there are no limits. Um, and I think that, you know, that's, that's kind of why I'm in politics is because, you know, I was born and raised in Texas in, in small town America, and uh, I'm proud to be doing the work that I am today. Well, and of course, Texas is the state from which uh, Ann Richards came. Oh, yeah. Another great, great woman politician. So how does your father feel about what you're doing now? Yeah, you know, I was going to look. I have a, I think it's in my other room. I have an Ann Richards book, actually, uh, like full of her portraits and quotes. And, um, you know, my dad, uh, my, I'm, I'm the only progressive person in my entire family, in my entire media family. Um, which is really interesting because my family is incredibly supportive, incredibly supportive. Um, you know, my father in particular, it's, it's baffling to me, you know, to, to go from hearing my dad, you know, watch the 2020 election and be like, oh, you know, this guy Biden, you know, he's he's something and da da da. And then, you know, fast forward to now, and it's a true story, you know, being in a restaurant with my dad and him pulling up photos to show the waitress of, look, my daughter met the president. Like the president knows my daughter. And so, uh, you know, we still don't disagree. Uh, my dad is still a Republican, but I think that, I think my family is a really good example of what I wish more of America could be like 
Uh, you know, we fundamentally disagree on a lot of things, but it has never changed how my family supports me or is there for me or loves me, uh, you know, and would do anything for me, uh, you know, even though we don't agree. And so my dad has come a really long way. And I think it's because of the polarization problem of thinking, you know, the other side is evil. The other side, they're all of the people, you know, the voters, they, they're crazy. And, you know, my dad and my family, they can't really think that, you know, when my, his daughter, who he loves dearly and is very close to him, uh, you know, is now one of the loudest voices in that space. And so uh, my dad is very loving. He's, he's a great dad uh, and I give him credit where credit is due. Uh, still working on changing that party affiliation. Uh, and I have faith that we'll get there one day. But one step at a time. But I also think there's a really important lesson for all of us, right? Which is that people are not always defined mm -hmm. by a tribe or what they believe that you can have warm, wonderful relationships with people with whom you disagree and that they can be supportive of you. And so it's really worth having the conversations with family and loved ones, even when you disagree, simply because in the end, that's what we have to have, right? We have to scale this up from family, up to community, up to state, up to country, right? Mm -hmm. And so, so you, you hit my radar on the day that Matt Gates insulted you. And so can you give everybody a little bit of that story and that how it happened and, and, and you know, what, and what happened? Because to me, it's like, there's like me before Olivia and after Olivia and the day, okay? And it's really important because I think young people are, they, they're our hope, right? And, mm -hmm. and I think that, you know, the trick here is to get everybody to understand the world as you're looking at it. And, you know, they don't even have to agree with you. They just have to share the, um, the view that, that this stuff matters, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the, Matt Gates, um, the Matt Gates incident is actually really interesting to me because he is not the first politician who I have publicly sparred with. And a lot of people don't know that. I um, did. So tell, tell, tell us yeah. about that. So before Matt Gates, I had two very notable run-ins with elected officials. Um, the first one being the Attorney General of Texas, Ken Paxton, and the second one being the Governor of Virginia, Glenn Youngkin. Well, so you chose you choose your foil. I do to have political run-ins with. I, I do. Uh, I, I think that my age has kind of given me this benefit of these people thinking I'm naive or impulsive, uh, and I'm not. You know, I, I pick who I want to start beef with, and, you know, it, it always seems to work out in my favor. Uh, you know, with, with Ken Paxton, he was running for attorney general at the time, and I, you know, started this online campaign to flood his comments on social media with proof of his indictment. Uh, and it wasn't like a couple, com it was like, we're talking like hundreds of comments with proof that he was indicted. And that- well, it, was, And just for our audience, he's been under indictment for what, eight years, right? Yeah, I mean like for most of his elected position, he has been indicted. He's committed criminal acts. Uh, he defrauded his own clients as a lawyer. And so what ended up happening is he ended up blocking me on Twitter, which is a problem because Ken Paxton had previously been sued for doing that because it, it violated the First Amendment rights of his constituents. Right. And so being a constituent of Ken Paxton, he had legally already been told that he could not block me on social media. And so once he did, and I had proof of it, um, I immediately posted it online and I was on the phone with ACLU Texas the same day, ready to file a lawsuit against Ken Paxton for violating my first amendment rights. Um, and so what the funny part about this story is, I talked to ACLU Texas and then I talked to Newsweek and Newsweek puts out an article where in the article, I pretty much say, um, I would think he would wisen up. He's in a runoff election. And I like pretty much alluded to like, if you don't unblock me, I'm going to sue you and I'm going to win. Um, 
And the next day he unblocked me and I thought it was because the ACLU had already sent him a notice, but apparently they never got far enough to send it. He unblocked me because of the Newsweek article where I threatened him with a lawsuit. So at that point, um, I had already, you know, had a bunch of run-ins with Texas Republican figures, including Paxton. And then in Virginia, Glenn Youngkin had put out this tip line, the CRT tip line to report teachers. And in the same vein of the abortion tip line, I did the same thing where I was like, send in fake tips to this. And my friend Sophia, who is my coworker at Gen Z for Change, she made a website where you could like email with a click. Um, and so we sent, oh my gosh, I wanna say it was over 100,000 fake emails to this tip line. And it was so bad in fact, that the governor's office, his press secretary put out an official statement saying that what we were saying was untrue. And now there are actually lawsuits um, because uh, there was a Freedom of Information Act request for the tip line material and the governor's office would not release it. And so now there's ongoing lawsuits um, with different organizations about them releasing what is in this tip lines and we know that it's because we filled it with fake tips. And so before the Matt Gates thing even happened, I was already, you know, in, you know, Washington Post, Newsweek for messing with these Republican elected officials. Um, and a simple Google search would have shown him that. Um, but how the Matt Gates thing started was he gave a speech at the Turning Point USA Student Action Summit. And it was probably one of the most just disgustingly misogynistic, sexist things I'd ever heard in my entire life. You know, he gave his uh, description of an abortion rights activist. And I was like, you know what? Okay. So I tweeted out, I said, um, Matt Gates, alleged pedophile, which he is, um, uh, said this at this summit, you're wrong. I'm not 5'3". I'm 5'11", 6'4 in heels. I wear them to remind small men like you of your place. Um, and I said that very well knowing that I could likely get a response from Matt Gates. I'm, I'm not stupid. I knew he could see it and respond. Um, what I did not expect was for him to do it in the way that he did, which was to quote tweet a Newsmax article saying that the speech that he gave was sure to raise the dander of his political opponents. And so then he screenshotted my photo and quote tweeted that and said dander raised and posted it to his Twitter where he had 1.4 million followers. And so I, you know, a lot of people ask me, you know, how did you feel? Were you upset? I was not upset. I was extremely happy because this idiot had fallen right into the trap that I had set for him without much, you know, pause. He kind of just went right for it. And so um, he he did, he did body shame me. That was his attempt was to, to say that, you know, I fulfilled this description. And so in turn, I was like, okay, you know, Matt Gates, you wanna do this? Well, I can do something too. So I started fundraising for abortion funds. And I started doing it in a very Gen Z way. You know, I was posting, uh, I was posting memes. Um, I, you know, once we hit 50,000 rays, I, you know, posted a thank you card with a very embarrassing photo of him. And I was like, get wrecked. Uh, and you know, within, within, I want to say five days, we raised over $2 million for abortion funds across the country. Um, and, you know, to this day, every once in a while, you know, Matt Gates or someone from his office will comment about me and something. Um, but the really great conclusion to this saga is I actually confronted him face to face a few weeks ago. Um, I was invited to the State of the Union by Congresswoman Nanette Barragan as her guest. And I'm standing on the floor outside the House chamber and I see him. Uh, and I was nervous at first, but he came over and, you know, the congressman was like, oh, Matt, I just want to introduce you to my guest. And I put my hand out, I shake his hand, and I can tell that he doesn't know who I am yet. And so I kind of lean in, I'm like, I just want to say thank you for helping me raise $2 million for abortion funds. 
and he drops my hand and goes back and just the most disgusted look on his face and he turns to walk away and he's like muttering insults and you know I yell at him down this hallway and I'm like pretty sure I have more integrity than you do um but I mean I think that his actions reflect exactly what people like Matt Gates think is you know he's all talk online and he thought he was big and bad you know attacking a 19 year old girl and then uh you know when confronted with that said girl face to face he turned around and ran away uh and so you know i think that that's just a great conclusion to the story of matt gates has a weak handshake and he's weak-willed so when you think about that experience and and I, let's put the youngkin and and paxton things together because here you have three politicians who have essentially link themselves to the most extreme views in our political spectrum mm -hmm. and whose basic approach is to gain political currency by harming the civil rights of other people. So you've had these successes. Where, as you're looking at it, do you want to take that? You know, what is, you have shown us one aspect of what can be done. Mm -hmm. Are there other things that you would like to do with this? Or is it enough from your point of view to just show how incredibly hip hypocritical these people are and to effectively use them to raise both the awareness of and funding of the causes that they oppose? Mm -hmm. I think that, you know, I think it's twofold because I think that, you know, it not only shows what can be done but I also think that it has brought not only a new perspective, but a new voice to the table. Um, and I talk about this a lot, you know, when we're talking about people in the realm of politics who are in the fold of it, who are talking to campaigns, talking to elected offices consistently, how many of those people are young? Not a lot. And also, you know, how many of those people are young, Latin, openly LGBTQ plus size women. You know, when I look at politics from an outside perspective, I did not see people who represented me. I did not see young people in general in those spaces. And so I think that what it's done is it's given me the opportunity to show people what's possible, but to also show, you know, young people and people in general who have the same identities that I do that you don't need to be ashamed. You don't need to back down from these fights. You can be bold and vocal about it. Um, but I think it also has sent a message to people who have kind of been in those positions of power where, uh, you know, I'm not gonna wait for you to pass the torch to me. I'm yeah. going to take it. And you can either get in line with that or you can get out of the way. And thankfully, a lot of people in this space have been very inclined to help kind of usher up the next generation um, but the ultimate goal for me is, you know, to steer this, to steer this country in a positive direction and to give young people the power to do that. Uh, and that starts with, for one, having a seat at the table to have those conversations, which I feel like now I can say I have accomplished. Uh, and I just want to bring more young people with me into the fold now. Well, and if we look at the environment, the last, call it sec six months, have seen some really really notable changes, right? I mean, Maxwell Frost in Florida getting elected to the House of Representatives, you know, he's been very visible as a member of your generation doing incredibly. But what's just happened in Tennessee with the two Justins, I mean, that is the real deal. Those are the Republicans managed to take two members of the legislature of the state of Tennessee who were previously not known outside there, practically outside the communities they grew up in and made them into national figures who, as far as I can tell, I mean, they're extraordinary, right? And so, you know, we started with AOC, right? And then we brought in a few more people in Congress, now Maxwell Frost, and now we have these two young men who I just have extraordinary positive viewpoints of. And to me, those those are, it feels like, like we're starting to see a little bit of proliferation. Um, I want to come back to this, but I want to take your pulse on a couple other things before we come back to where we go, okay? Mm -hmm. The first is you've been extraordinarily successful at using internet platforms, social media platforms to 
to push for what you believe. Mm -hmm. At the same time, those exact same platforms are the tools that the people you're fighting against have used to create the problem in the first place. Mm -hmm. And I'm really curious whether you have, do you have any points of view about that? You know, as to the good and bad and whether you would like to see in time some changes in the way, you know, what we expect of internet platforms to make them less destructive to our democracy and to candidly the civil rights of the people who live mm -hmm. there. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I think, I think social media is a tool just like, you know, any other thing out there that exists. And the analogy that I'll use sometimes is, you know, you have a knife, you can either use it to chop up vegetables and make food for your family, or you could use it to stab somebody. Uh, you know, like both are possible outcomes that you have from this tool, but the reality is it's not the tool itself that's causing the problem. It's the person who's yielding it. Um, and social media as a tool is not the problem. Uh, th there's two problems in both. Number one, there is that there is a digital literacy problem in this country of primarily older generations not knowing how to dispel disinformation and misinformation and not understanding um, the very nature of social media, which is a real problem. Uh, and the second problem is uh, you know, one company in particular, I'll say Facebook, having a monopoly over a lot of these different digital media companies. So what we see happening now is, you know, it's uh, Facebook having a monopoly and other social media companies. Not, are they, not only are they not really regulated, um, but they also have money involved in political elections that keep them from being regulated. And so when people talk to me about, you know, what do we do with social media? Social media has been incredibly powerful in mobilizing not just young voters, but voters in general. It is a very effective tool uh, in getting true, accurate information out there. Uh, and I think that that's why you've seen a lot of people kind of get really concerned with Elon Musk buying Twitter is because Twitter was a really large source of news for the majority of people. That's how I got my news every day. And so when we see, you know, these platforms kind of be taken over and changed, uh, it can get a little bit trickier. And I think TikTok is the is the, probably the biggest example that people have talked about lately in relations to public safety. And we talk about, you know, banning TikTok. Okay, well, why do we want to ban TikTok? Well, they say it's a national security threat. Okay, if we're going by that metric, it is proven that Facebook has sold people's data or leaked people's data to influence political elections. Um, it's been proven, you know, that some search engines have altered results to benefit a candidate. These are things that have been proven. Um, if we want to fix that problem, the solution is passing broad regulation and safety measures for people to protect them from social media companies themselves not necessarily the platform. Uh, so, you know, passing bills to ban uh, data harvesting, passing legislation to, to make it illegal for these companies to hold your data and to hold it for longer than necessary. Uh, we need comprehensive, large sweeping uh, policy to protect people on the back end. On the front end where you have, you know, misinformation and disinformation, I think the solution to that is in the same way that, you know, we teach kids in school um, how to, you know, how to do adult functions, you know, how do you, how do you read literature? How do you analyze poetry? In the same way that we teach young people in schools how to do those things, we also need to teach them how do you safely guide the internet? That's something I think that we should be teaching young people. How do you determine what is true and what is false online? Because, you know, when I was in high school, we learned how to do that when we were writing research papers. We learned, you know, what sources are accurate, what sources aren't. Why can we not also teach people how to do that with general information online? Uh, so I think uh, infiltrating and putting in that into, you know, public school curriculum is one way of counteracting that. And I think the other way of counteracting that is I would love to see, you know, community colleges or universities uh, take that up for older folks too, who aren't super familiar with the internet. 
So passing policy to protect people's data uh, from you know bad faith actors, but then also putting educational tools in place to help people be able to tell the truth from the fake online, I think is the way to kind of solve that you know uh, polarization problem, but also a way to kind of keep these companies in check and keep them from profiting off of sowing division. Um, I think I think that's a very long winded answer, but that's kind of my the solution that I would do. Okay, so have you thought through then the implications of, of regenerative AI like chat GPT? Yes. Because quite one of the issues with that, right, is that because it's based on data scraped from the web, there's no differentiation between fact and fiction on the way in, mm -hmm. which you can't trust what comes out of it. And that it will generate such a huge, because a billion people use chat GPT in the first two months. Mm -hmm. right? the number of results being put back out into the internet, which are false, but appear to be true, right? Mm -hmm. All of that's going into the corpus of, of the internet. So the internet is rapidly going to look from a content point of view, like ChatGPT, and which means the amount of stuff that's not true is gonna grow much more rapidly than the amount mm -hmm. of stuff is true. And the issue of how you protect yourself against that is going to be very much harder than it was. Mm -hmm. I think that's, I mean, you know, personally, you know, I'm a college student uh, and I refrain from using ChatGPT kind of for that reason. Um, but I think that this just kind of goes back to tr pu trying to push people towards some more forms of almost traditional media when fact checking, you know, your, you know, your local newspapers, your, you know, your Washington Post, your New York Times. Um, and I think that AI is, it's deeply concerning to me because, you know, not only do we have ChatGBT, which like, as you said, can have some informational gaps there, but how far we've come with video AI and voice AI is also very concerning to me because I'm concerned that, you know, in the future, we could potentially be put in a position where, you know, we have deep fakes of world leaders and which is already happening online i've already seen some saying things that they very obviously have not said and now you know people believe that these are real things that have happened and so i i honestly you know i'm not a tech person i'm not super familiar with ai but i really do think that we need to have some kind of protections put in place um because i don't think that that's particularly harmful to one side or the other i think that that in general would be harmful to probably the entire population. Uh, and I, I hope that we can see some kind of progress on that. I know that we saw a group of tech leaders come out and say like, we have to halt, you know, the advancement of AI because this is too much. Uh, and I agree, you know, AI is a scary thing. Um, and I, I kind of hope that we slow down and really reflect on the amount of, you know, influence that we're giving it in the way that we dictate our information and educational tools right now. So if I may just respond to that slightly, just mm -hmm. to prove the, the awareness of people. Mm -hmm. So the issue with the first AIs was that they were originally applied to um, very clerically intensive things like the review of applications for mortgages or reviewing resumes for jobs or for predictive policing. And it turns out because the people in Silicon Valley have no incentive to think about safety. Mm -hmm. the, the data sets that they used to train those things were filled with bias. And the result was famously Amazon in its resume review app rejected every single woman. And in fact, resume review apps have structural issues of bias for age, race, and gender. Predictive policing winds up justifying massive abuses of black and brown people because the data sets all come from the places where over policing of black and brown people is really popular mortgages same thing you have this thing called digital redlining which is the exclusion of people of color from certain neighborhoods and the reason that those applications exist is because the people who buy them are actually really comfortable with those biases police departments are comfortable over policing black and brown neighborhoods banks are comfortable with digital redlining and lots of employers like to have a black box that says it's okay to exclude women and old people. And so to me, 
that was the start and that should have been the easy part and then you go from there to the stuff people are doing now and if you think about facebook using it for moderation it doesn't work at that scale it just it, there's no way for the for the ai it's not smart the same thing with self-driving cars it's just not smart enough and so the key thing is the problem with those tech leaders is they're talking about you know something of like 2001 where the ai has become an overlord they're they're like completely comfortable with all of the harms all of the biases and things that are going on today and they're completely comfortable with the, the nonsense being generated by chat gpt and i look at this and I go excuse me these things are hurting people today mm -hmm. what we need to do is to change the incentives and the business models of the companies the same way we need to do the same thing for google and facebook and TikTok. and so the great thing for the people in this audience is you have the power because it's your attention that they desperately need. So you can do things relative to tech products that are exactly like what you, Olivia, have done relative to politics, which is to say, you know, they want you to believe there's only one path and that it's inevitable. And that's nonsense. Technology is just the product of what people make. It's their values that are reflected in it. And so we can influence Mm -hmm. Right. Look at what people are doing. I mean, there's this wonderful blue check campaign against Elon at TikTok, right? Where you know you've seen people come out and go, blue checks are destroying TikTok or is destroying Twitter. Excuse me. Mm -hmm. And that's demonstrably true. And the the users are rebelling. And this is the thing: you do not. None of us has to go along with this. Mm -hmm. And that's the key thing. Okay. So let's bring you back to the to where we're going. So on TikTok, you're obviously right. You know, you can go to Oracle today and buy, I think, 15,000 data points on every American for like $100,000, mm -hmm. you know, and obviously China has done that. And so the notion that TikTok is worse on data than other people is laughable. Mm -hmm. And in my mind, we, we really need to think about the national security implications of all of these problems. So for you, when you're thinking about your peers, Mm -hmm. What's the message that you want them to pick up about just politics and their role mm -hmm. and their opportunity? Because the way you describe it, it sounds like fun. <laughs> um, it, it is and it isn't. You know, um, politics is very draining because if you're not dealing with, you know, some kind of radicalization or tragedy, you're dealing with checks and balances, which can be really irritating. Um, and I'll point to, you know, student loan forgiveness as an example of that. There's a lot of people out there, and this kind of goes back to that information gap. There's a lot of people out there who think that, oh, you know, student debt forgiveness just hasn't happened because Biden just didn't want to follow through with it. That's not true. Um, it got caught up in the courts as a lot of things do. And now we're waiting to hear what the court's ruling is going to be on it. Um, but as far as, you know, my peers, you know, politics is exhausting. I'm not going to lie to you and say that it's not. But the reality is our generation is going to be at the forefront, whether we like it or not. You know, by, by 2028, you know, Gen Z and millennials are going to be the dominant voting demographic. Um, they're going to be the ones leading the majority of voting and eligible voters in the country. And I think it's really important for us to get involved now so that when that thing happens, we know that, you know, elected officials are putting forward a people first agenda. And so if you're one of my peers and, you know, you're wanting to get involved in politics, you're wanting to do more, you should. You should get involved. Uh, you should make it a point to vote in every single election not just the presidential election, you know, school boards, DAs, uh, city council members, county commissioners, you know, they're going to have the most effect on your day to day life. And so I want my peers to, to oh, my dog is awake from his nap. Um, I want my peers to know that, you know, it might be intimidating to get involved. Um, but if we want the country to go in the direction that we want it to, we have to get involved. Well, it, it, it's the country right now is. <laughs> by people are a lot older than I am and I'm not young, okay? And that is insane. Mm -hmm. They're making decisions in their self-interest which directly harm your generation. And, you know, I mean, immigration policy is a great example, right? But um, obviously everything related to the Dobbs ruling on 
women's reproductive health. That is entirely about young people. And all of these choices, whether it's student loans, whether it's health care and health insurance, whether it's just the rules of employment, all of these things are biased against young people today. And one of the things that strikes me is that Gen Z is large enough by number that if you could persuade 70% of Gen Z people to vote in every election, mm -hmm. you could control politics. You'd elect all your own people and you'd wipe out everybody else. And, you know, so in a sense, one of the things to think about is just to, for your generation to feel empowered, to recognize actually, if you act together, this will be your world. And my generation with the Vietnam War was lucky enough to be able to engage in that way. And as you correctly pointed out earlier, we are dealing with all the same issues today. And I would actually argue that it's, it's worse because they're tearing apart democracy and they're tearing apart your ability to make your own choices. And so, so if you're sitting there talking to people out here, because they don't all have to get involved full time. Mm -hmm. And they, and in a sense, you want them to do more than just vote, right? I mean, mm -hmm. if everybody votes, then that's enough. But there's a thing in between which isn't depressing. Mm -hmm. Talk about that. Because you didn't start by doing what you're doing now. You started one piece at a time, right? With yeah. And yeah, I mean, I, I started with, you know, just voicing my opinion online, but I also, you know, mutual aid and nonprofit sphere, I've kind of always been involved with. And I think it's, it's probably the most rewarding space to be in. Uh, you know, there are a lot of gaps in this country where policies failed, where people come in um, and they do the right thing. And so for me, I always encourage young people to get involved with a local nonprofit or organization that they agree with. And, you know, if you're in Houston, I always like to point to the Houston Food Bank. You know, hunger is a huge problem in this country and policy has not been able to solve that, but people have been able to. And it's, you know, just normal working class people who come together at these different nonprofits and organizations because they care about their fellow Americans. Uh, and I think that that space gets kind of left behind a lot of the time. Uh, and there's a gap of people volunteering or donating. And I wish that people more often not only, you know, express their opinions with those around them, uh, but really get involved and be an active member of their community in an organizational capacity. So if, if we were, well, I love that. <laughs> he's, he's excited. He wants to talk about voting. <laughs> Bring him right out in front. I mean, why not? We're, we're a big tent here. Mm -hmm. So so you've been at this for a bunch of years. Mm -hmm. And you see an effect in your generation? Are you finding that, that people are listening to your message and saying, I want to join you as opposed to asking you what you're going to do next? Oh, 100%. I mean, you know. So tell I us about that. At this point in our in our age in our age group, you know, Gen Z is more civically engaged than any other generation. And that's a fact. You know, Gen Zs were were more informed because of technology. Um, we have a greater ability to get involved because of technology. And so what I've seen is, you know, I growing up, you know, I've heard about you know young people making their voice heard a little bit here, a little bit there. But if you look at just the movements in this country you know they're it's breathtaking you know you see hundreds of thousands if not millions of people marching across the country to do and accomplish different things and most of those crowds are young people uh and i think that you know between the voting demographics we've seen you know like d plus 22 voting shifts um to seeing you know young people protest different things at their universities. I think it's very clear that young people are really, really involved and they're paying attention. And, you know, I think my generation is a lot smarter than people give us credit for it. I'm really excited about that. So, so what, what can all of us do? Mm -hmm. Right. You know, guide us, tell us, you know, what you would, what you would have the people listening to this program mm -hmm. do. What's the first step? Yeah. Uh, the first step is to make sure that you're registered to vote always make sure it's correct. Uh, the second step is, you, you know, deciding in what capacity do you want to be involved? Do you want to be involved in a political capacity? Or do you want to be involved in an advocacy capacity? If you want to be involved in a political capacity, um, don't focus your entire sights on the presidential election. 
there are a lot of really important local government and local offices that need volunteers and need campaign workers too. Um, you know, your city council races are a great place to start. County judges are a great place to start. They have a lot of power. Uh, and the majority of damage that's being done in this country is being done in state legislatures. Uh, and so getting involved in those races, donating to those campaigns, block walking for them, that's a way to start getting involved more so with political advocacy. Um, if you want to get involved with, you know, advocacy in general, finding a local nonprofit or a chapter of a larger nonprofit that you feel particularly passionate about uh, is another really good way to get involved. You know, in Texas, um, a lot of the reproductive health care work is done through the abortion funds, which are always looking for volunteers. Uh, if you're really passionate about gun violence uh, prevention, you know, Moms Demand Action and Students Demand Action has chapters all over the country. Um, so there's those, really those two ways to get involved. And if that's just too much for you, if it's really hard for you to, to put that effort and energy or financial support into those institutions, um, honestly, sharing the messages from those institutions with people around you uh, and just kind of speaking up about what your beliefs are goes a lot farther than you think because our friends and family most of the time are the people who influence uh, a lot of our not only political opinions but moral and ethical opinions as well. So there's really those three ways for you to get involved in some capacity. So have you had any interaction with Indivisible, for example? Because that is that's an organization which is fundamentally national by being local, right? And it yeah. gives people an opportunity to engage politically in their local community in ways that are pretty profound and it's super light touch. It doesn't require mm -hmm. commitments of time unless you choose to give massive commitments of time. Yeah, in Indivisible is great. Uh, I haven't worked with them individually before, but I have in uh, you know, a nonprofit capacity. Um, March for Our Lives, Moms Demand Action, Sunrise Movement, you know, local food banks. I mean, there's just so many to name. Uh, you know, Voto Latino, uh, there, change the ref, lots of different things. Um, run, run for something, which does first for time candidates in local elections. You've got Emerge America, which does women. Mm -hmm. You know, it's 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 all of there's a, the key point I think that you're making mm -hmm. is there's no one way. There are people can do the thing that suits them. Yep. And so when how it when you think about this, I think most people think of politics as about voting. Mm -hmm. What you're saying is politics is about actually first intellectual engagement in the process to know what's mm -hmm. going on. The second is to sort of pick the thing you care about and find a way to make sure that at minimum your voice is heard. Mm -hmm. And ideally that action is being taken to bring about isn't that's I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I think that's what you're saying. Yeah, no, that's exactly it. I think uh, I think the uh, more than I would say probably most political apathy that we have in this country comes from a lack of understanding of civic systems. And that, that is by design. It's why there, it's why, you know, we have right wing people attacking education is because they don't want people to know, you know, what are the systems in place. Um, and so, you know, the biggest thing that people can do to kind of combat extremism is to be civilly educated or civically educated on how governmental systems work. You know, I mean, how many people out there know what the filibuster is? How many people out there, you know, know what the job scope of the, you know, Secretary of Transportation is? You know, these are things that are fundamentally important to how our democracy functions. And the majority of people don't know how it works. Uh, and that's, that's a problem. And so, I mean, exactly what you said of it's about education, but it's also about um, being engaged in those conversations and steering uh, steering the narratives that are being put forward. So when you think about stuff that your generation can impact, mm -hmm. you've mentioned student loans, which strikes me as a tax on young people, mm -hmm. actually forces them into certain careers that suit the people who are in power, right? So doing something about student loans strikes me as like one of the most important priorities the country should have right now. Right. I mean, is you agree, disagree? Is that a no, I do agree. I think that, you know, the way that the student loan crisis has been approached 
uh, been approached is flawed. I think student debt forgiveness is great, but if we just forgive debt without reforming the system that allowed it to become a problem in the first place, then we're just bandaging a wound. Uh, you know, we need to ban predatory lending practices. We need to, you know, uh, make community college free. And, you know, those are things that have to be done. I think that that goes back to the civic education. And we have to invest in public education all the way down. A hundred percent. I mean, right. all the way down. Pay, pay teachers more. Uh, actually fund schools adequately. Like, ugh. Libraries. Libraries. Don't defund public libraries. Right. As, why we even have to have that conversation baffles me. Okay, so, so it, then you've got the whole thing of the rights of workers when they're in jobs, right? Because mm -hmm. workers have negligible rights in huge parts of the economy. And that, it strikes me as a Gen Z issue. You're all about to begin your adult lives. And so that's a place where people can get involved also, right? And because mm -hmm. their whole industry is based on taking advantage of workers, right? Mm -hmm. and, and then how about healthcare, right? Another place where young people often forego health insurance because it's both too expensive and really hard to, administratively hard to get. Mm -hmm. right? and, I mean, I'm just picking three issues that it strikes me are really important uh, mm -hmm. for young people and, and ones that are gonna have a huge effect on your life where the sooner you fix them, the happier you're gonna be. Yeah, I mean, intersectionality is the focal point of all of these and every single thing that young people are passionate about. So, so you know, as, as we're coming towards the end of our thing here, mm -hmm. I want you to talk about where you're going and who you would like to come with you and how we can contribute to that. Oh, goodness. I mean, for me, you know, I just, I'm just activism and organizing. That's, that's where I'm at. I have no intention of running for office in any time in the near future. Um, I just want young people to have more space at the table. I want young people to have more power in these policy negotiations. Uh, and so, you know, that's my main goal is to be at the table that is deciding what the policy platforms of the, you know, progressives or the Democratic Party is. Uh, but I don't want it to just be me. I want it to be, you know, my generation having a seat and having a voice consistently, not just when it comes time for elections. Uh, and that's kind of my goal is to, to get us there and establish that, you know, we're not just a bunch of kids. We, a lot of us are coming into adulthood. We're smart. We know what it takes. Uh, and we're, we're not comfortable with the status quo anymore. We're demanding more. And so do you feel like you need to, that you want to have an organization mm -hmm. to represent Gen Z the same way that, you know, the, the, yeah, I mean, old folks have their organization and the NRA has their thing, right? Do we need to have something that, that is the, you know, the, the Gen Z mm -hmm. and, you know, I, I don't think that there's going to be any one in particular. Uh, you know, Gen Z for Change, we work really closely with March for Our Lives and Sunrise Movement. And I think that that's kind of the beautiful thing about this generation is that we've kind of very much built our platform on collective action. And because of that, I don't see there being one particular group that does, you know, the, the most of the work. I think that it's all of us bringing our coalitions together. Uh, and I think that that's probably the scariest part for those who have um, differing platforms for us is that we're working together consistently to try to affect change. Well, that's important because one of the things that may not be obvious to people is that in, in the seats of power, whether it's in a city hall or a state legislature or mm -hmm. Congress or the presidency, the people who win are the ones who have somebody there all the time. Mm -hmm. Right. It can be a group of people. That's fine. But but it's that having the, pre, you know, the political power comes from making sure that you never miss a meeting, that nobody can make a decision behind closed doors that you're not touching. Mm -hmm. 
having um, having pe- having faces in all the places uh and a group that's really great about doing that is common cause uh you know gen z for change we're a digital organization um but you know common cause is has been incredible yeah i see there i'll be at the capitol and they'll just have people there every day you know advocating for different things and it's really special to see um more and more young people and youth focus groups having that presence um and I, I'm, I'm just particularly excited to see it continue to expand in the next couple of years. Well, and, and so, so uh, are there changes that you would like to advocate for in your generation to make democracy work better? You know? Well, I mean, uh, protecting polling places on college campuses is a great way to start because that's consistently become under attack now. Um, and I mean, not only that, but investing in young people is critical not just for creating a healthy country but for creating a healthy voting base you know we, i think a lot of times young people kind of get wrapped up in this uh well they only care about climate and gun prevention gun violence prevention and abortion those are the things they care about young people really care about the economy they really care about protecting their economic future and about being able to have those kinds of things. And so I think that the biggest shift that I would like to see is I would like to see young people be treated more seriously in the space of politics. Uh, And I would like to see more investment in giving them those tools that they need. Uh, I know that people have talked about mobile voting. If that is a viable thing that could be done in the future, I don't know. I'm not a tech expert. I'm not, you know, a, a voting rights lawyer, but it should not be difficult for people to vote. It should not be difficult for people to participate in a democracy. Uh, that is contradictory of the very concept. Um, and so I think, you know, more investments into college campuses, more investments into, you know, just working class neighborhoods in general, I think would see a lot more benefit to, to young people and to my generation. Well, let's let's wrap on that lovely note. I mean, Olivia Giuliana, you have been an inspiration to me. And I say this as someone who spent seven years in full-time hand-to-hand combat in Washington doing political advocacy for tech reform. And, you know, you accomplished more in 48 hours around Matt Gates than I feel like I accomplished in seven years. Um, I just believe that young people are, you know, the most important resource that we have and that as you say intersectionality both generational by gender by race by everything it's really the things we have in common mm-hmm. are so much more important than the things that are and a big part of this is educating everybody so they know that absolutely and you are part of that so thank you so much for doing this and i do hope we'll stay in touch and i would encourage everyone pay attention to this woman she a great leader and i just think uh you know if 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 we could go from to have a couple of million people who follow in her path we can fix any problem we face i like to hope so outstanding thank you so very much olivia thank you